The global ener energy economy was turned on its head uh, a little over a week ago when Russia invaded Ukraine, and there were two significant uh, developments to today. Uh, we're talking about uh, March 8th, Tuesday, March 8th. Uh, the Americans banned uh, Russian oil and petroleum products, and the Europeans out, uh, outlined a plan to wean themselves off all Russian energy well before 2030, quote, unquote. So I'm going to talk to energy writer, uh, Sean McCarthy about that. He joins us from Ottawa. Welcome to the interview, Sean. Hello again, Markham. Well, look, let's start with the Americans first. Um, what is uh, Joe Biden up to with uh, banning uh, Russian oil and petroleum products? It actually started in Congress. Uh, Biden was uh, not keen to go down this path. Um, there, there are a couple of uh, sponsors. Uh, um, Manson, in fact, uh, who we had uh, heard a lot from uh, from West Virginia, uh, a big oil and gas uh, uh, recipient of uh, oil and gas money, and Lisa Murkowski from Alaska sponsored the bill. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not insignificant, but they, the Americans did not import a whole lot of Russian oil and gas, actually more refined product and, than crude into the US in the last several months. So uh, I, I think it is a, another shot across the bow. Um, it would be uh, far more meaningful to the Russians if, the, if, the, if others followed in the American footsteps, but it's, um, it's definitely a part of the effort at tightening the financial screws on Putin. Yeah, I, by my calculations, uh, Russian crude oil made up about 3.5% of American uh, consumption. And that's about that's 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 a lot that that was at the peak kind of last year. It, it's really gone down. Uh, December, January, February, it was very, very mo modest. Fair enough. Well, uh, and of course, the, the domestic politics played a big role in uh, Biden's decision making because uh, every American president knows that you do not want to raise the price of gasoline on American consumers. Right. And uh, I thought it was funny in the press release from the uh, sponsors of the bill, they said they would be quite prepared to take the heat for for this uh, and uh, and defend it. But you know who's going to wear it. It'll be Biden. Um, he's very concerned about the upcoming uh, midterm elections when Congress will, a third of the Senate and, and all of the House of Representatives will be uh, up for re-election uh, come November. And as, as you know, the uh, Democratic hold on, on both houses is quite slim. And a lot of people think they could lose control of both houses. And then you get, you know, what, what we saw with uh, frankly, uh, much of Trump's regime and, and the second part of Obama, which is, you know, uh, a president from one party and Congress controlled by the other and, and very little getting done. Um, just to wrap up with the Americans, uh, where uh, is, uh, sorry, where is Biden going to make up the, the difference in, uh, in crude oil uh, and petroleum products? Uh, one of the things we've been watching, of course, is the American shale producers uh, have refused to really increase their output. They just prefer to enjoy higher profits, right. uh, high oil prices. Uh, right. Are we going to expect a change in that anytime soon? Well, uh, two things. I mean, at a dollar sixty-five uh, a gallon in the U.S., you know, the, the, uh, the demand is going to take a hit, right? I mean, people are going to drive less at, a, at you know, at, at these prices. So, um, we could see a significant drop off in, in consumption, given how little the Russian uh, uh, impact was on the market. That might do it. But, but you know, I, I know the U.S. shale producers say they're not interested, but uh, at these prices, it's going to be hard to uh, pass up. And I imagine and one of their biggest problems was getting finance and, and they'll have the financing. Uh, it was interesting to hear uh, the White House press secretary say talk about the number of leases 
that have been uh, put out there that uh, are not being drilled right now. So um, the, the land is there. Uh, the companies have the land available. If they want to drill it, they can. And then, uh, you know, Alberta, and we'll get into this, I know, but uh, uh, Minister Savage from Alberta said there's uh, capacity uh, for rail and pipelines for Alberta to, to increase uh, their production. So I, I would imagine, again, it's not going to be, you know, a million barrels a day or 800,000 barrels a day that you might have gotten from the Keystone XL, but it, um, it could be significant. Okay. And uh, let's talk about the Europeans now. Well, last week, the International Energy Agency released a 10-point plan that, yeah. said, that showed, showed how Europe could wean itself off uh, Russian gas. And yeah. this morning, the uh, EU uh, released the, the outline of a plan uh, basically to make uh, Europe independent of Russian energy of all types. And a lot of it will be you know, finding some other sources, but a big yeah. emphasis on uh, electrification and renewables. And also the Germans put uh, announced 220, or no, sorry, 200 uh, euros, billion euros uh, in order to do uh, their part of that plan. So what's your take on that? Well, on the natural gas side, a lot of the gas goes for electricity. Um, and so, you know, I, I, there's talk of the Germans reversing plans on shutting down some nukes. Uh, uh, I know the Belgians and the French were also moving in that direction. So this may uh, breathe some new life into, into nuclear plants that were planned for shutdown. Um, there will be, you know, uh, apparently there is additional um, capacity for, for bringing in LNG into, onto the continent. You know, there's only so much capacity. You have to be able to... Uh, uh, regasify it and, and put it into the system, but there is capacity to do that. So um, you can displace a certain amount of Russian pipeline gas with LNG. Um, and yeah, they're going to be looking for it. You can be sure they're going to be looking under every rock for new sources of gas. I mean, it, it's hard to uh, it, it's hard to reorganize the market uh, on the fly like that. But that you know that plus. Um, demand response will, will be uh, part of the plan. IEA also announced today that they'll be bringing forward a plan next week to uh, talk about how to reduce or eliminate um, dependence on Russian oil. Uh, and the signal is that it's going to rely very heavily on the demand side. Uh, you know, we talk, I, I, I tend to think that there is an over focus, over emphasis on, on replacing supply uh, from different sources when when both in the long term, certainly in the long term, the, the project is to try to get off fossil fuels because of climate change. Uh, and, and that's just as relevant for the short term as it is for the long term, especially you know, with prices where they are. Yeah, that's very interesting, in particular in the Canadian context, because we've seen Alberta, uh, Premier Jason Kenney in particular, really stumping for increased Canadian uh, exports. And the yeah. uh, CPC, uh, Pierre uh, Polyevre, the uh, yeah. you know, leading candidate to be the new leader, uh, doing the, the same thing. And yet what, it, what Europe is, seems to be doing is basically accelerating the plan they already had in place. They already had a green deal uh, for, for Europe. And it, it seems like they're going to double down on that and accelerate it, uh, as opposed to trying to fill in the gap, stop gaps with uh, other fossil fuels. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. I, I'm not sure they can do that completely. I do think that there is room for, for additional supply from elsewhere. I don't know, you know, I, I don't know about building long life infrastructure, new pipelines and, and, and that sort of thing for, uh, for, uh, getting more Alberta oil to market, but I, I do think there's a significant room for additional supply from elsewhere. I think it, I, I also think that it, it um, strengthens at least, uh, you know, the long running Alberta argument that we should be getting our oil from, you know, democratic countries rather than you know, Russia and Saudi Arabia, you know, there, I, I know that people have, have uh, criticize that that view of uh, Alberta being somehow uh, virtuous oil. But I mean, you know, the, the, we've seen what Russia is, we know what Saudi Arabia is, 
you know, uh, and and uh, the, the problem is, of course, Alberta oil is more expensive and and more carbon intensive. So, you know, what do you want here? Um, but and and it makes it it would make it very difficult for Canada to meet its climate commitments if we're talking about ramping up, not ramping down emissions from the uh, oil and gas industry in Western Canada. Yes, well, uh, you're talking to one of the biggest critics of the ethical oil argument. So. I know I am. <laughs> but, but but let's put that aside for another day, Sean, another conversation. Otherwise, I would be here all morning. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, and I see the, the point. I mean, you know, Europe can't make the transition to more to electrify in a hurry. This is this is. Uh, um, you can push the accelerator pedal harder on the bus, but it's the bus. This bus that's a bus that still is got a ways to go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We all and we all acknowledge that, but it would be very interesting to see because the Amer the, the Europeans are much further down this road than North America is. I, I mean, you know, they're uh, last year nineteen percent of of uh, EVs were sold. Uh, sorry, nineteen percent of all cars sold in Europe were electric vehicles. Right. So, and, and they've got policy in place that's further ahead than, than North America does. So it'll be interesting to see the extent to which they can substitute electricity for, for fossil fuels. And uh, what, so what do we make of-, of let's, let's be careful because they're also right now going through energy, um, even before the Russian invasion, they were going through huge problems with energy and, and cost of natural gas and cost of electricity. So, you know, I, I think that every politician in the Western world uh, has to be conscious of ensuring that their voters and their citizens don't, don't ascribe to the energy transition, the idea that this is coming at the at, a, at an unaffordable cost, you know, uh, if, if we lose people because they think that they can't afford um, to carry this, then we're going to get governments that, you know, like Jason Kennedy will say, you know, we'll, we'll do what we'll do the minimum, but uh, it's all about, you know, making sure you can uh, fill up your uh, half ton and drive as much as you want. I guess my take on that, uh, Sean, is that, uh, you know, I, I've written about how uh, energy transitions are generally follow a pattern, at least the, the last one did in, in the 20th century, you know, the first 20, 30 years of introducing new clean energy technologies, pretty slow the technologies, you know, it's, it's early, it's immature, and it need, so it takes 20 or 30 years to become competitive with the, with the new, or with, sorry, with the old technology, and then you have a decade or so uh, when it does become competitive, it's very disruptive. The, the old uh, energy system gets disrupted. It's being, technology is being pushed out of the market by the new ones. And then you've got a couple or three decades where it's kind of you know, moderate growth as the new technologies just uh, uh, become dominant. Right. And this is the 2020s of the disruptive decade. I've written about that. No, so I, I don't disagree with that, but I, I, I don't think it's happening fast enough without, without serious uh, and even greater uh, government policy push. You know, it's, it's, the transition is happening and it will happen. But, um, you know, you read, the, you read the IPCC report on how much time we have to, uh, uh, to respond to keep, to keep uh, global warming within that 1.5 degree range and the, and the huge, huge cost of not doing so. Uh, and and I, I just, we need government, we need everybody with their shoulder to the wheel pushing in one direction and, and, to, and to think that, you know, the private sector can do it through energy, through technological transformation is, is it's just going to happen too slow. We need, we need governments pushing all the time and we need a, an electorate that's willing to support that. And if we lose that electorate, it's going to slow everything down and we're going to be paying a big price. Our kids and our grandkids are going to be paying an enormous price. Well, if there's one thing that can motivate people and motivate governments to make changes, it's war. Yeah. And, and so that, that I guess, is you know, we don't know how long that conflict is going to drag out. It could be a few days, a few weeks, who knows? Uh, but clearly it's already sent a shock through uh, to governments. 
yeah. world wide and everybody's more concerned about energy security than they've ever been. And that's yes. a big driver to for policy. So uh, I think this is all an open question, but the, the trends are clear, but the outcome is not and the timing is not. And we'll So much is not clear, right? And, <laughs> and, and to me, one of the biggest questions is, you know, you say that war change, you know, drives drives change, but I mean, we've seen it in North America and, and the United States in particular. You know, I'm old enough to remember Vietnam, and and people people wanted to live their lives and not sacrifice anything, and and still finance a war which caused huge inflation in the U.S. Part partly contributed to. Um, We'll see whether whether North Americans are willing to accept the price of pushing back, even financially, let alone, you know, uh, um, with the big military buildup that people are talking about. Indeed, we will. We'll look forward to chatting with you about that in the future. Sean, thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. All right. Good to talk.